show a bit of lace, the advertisement cajoled, urging female listeners to buy a particular brand of knickers. No, this wasn't a new ad on China's CCTV, nor even a spot on London's Capital Radio. It certainly wasn't aired on any of the stations broadcasting in the Arabian Gulf. Instead, my mind was taken back nearly fifty years to the heady days of Mary Quant's miniskirt revolution, with stylish fashionistas in London's Carnaby Street leading the world in all things trendy, and to this particular advertisement aired on the now-defunct English-language service of Radio Luxembourg. The reasoning was flawless. With miniskirts now all of age, coupled with London's penchant for double-decker buses, the chic young things of the time could well have had a problem going up the stairs on the buses wearing their miniskirts. But were they to wear these trendy knickers, then their problems would be solved. I remember at the time thinking how useful they would have been for Alice in her wonderland, racing after the white rabbit and falling down, down, down into his bunny hole. What if Mr. Wabbit had looked up over his shoulder and actually caught a glimpse of her bottom? Heavens above! Could she have used a pair of those frilly knickers? I've been reminded of this advertisement quite recently, having arrived in the Chinese capital during the summer heatwave, so typical of Beijing. The vast majority of young girls here wear either ultra-short skirts or culottes, designed to look like skirts, and show off their legs to great effect. And that's all very well, but like London's double-decker buses, Beijing's subway, or metro system, can cause the female sorority something of a problem. The underground railway is a superb complex of engineering, with many of the stations deep below ground level. This means that there are very many stairs going down and very steep escalators going up, with the result that females tend to adopt a classic pose as they ride the escalators, of placing the back of their hand against their bottom to ensure that they aren't caught in a Marilyn Monroe moment as a gust of wind from the depths of the metro reveals too much in the way of eye candy for the appreciative males. Although, guys being guys the world over, this doesn't stop them from craning their necks to see what little there is to see. Beijing's metro is a wonderful place for people watching, and I have to say I'm quite a fan of the subway system here. For just two RMB, around 19 pence or 25 cents, you can travel from one end of Beijing to the other from around 5 a.m. to nearly midnight. It doesn't matter how far you travel, be it just one stop or the entire length of the line and then some, it will still cost you just 2 RMB. Of course, you'll be damned lucky to ever get a seat unless you start off at the end of the line. Probably the best time to travel is around 5.30 in the morning or after 10 at night. But apart from the crowds, it's simplicity itself to find your way around. Notices are written both in Chinese and Pinyin, and on board there are adequate displays of where on the line you are and what the next station is likely to be. On the platforms there are TV sets to make sure you don't get bored during the four to five minutes you might have to wait between trains. The Chinese love their TVs and you'll find them everywhere, in lifts, in lobby areas, in shopping centres, in the streets, in stations, it seems no one can live without a feed of some entertainment channel or other, all interspersed with the infomercials at every turn. Well, these TVs obviously work, as the well-mannered Chinese patiently queue up, waiting for their train, while being fed with live feeds from some sporting event or a rock concert or whatever. If you think that the metro is a good deal, then wait till you try the buses. A standard journey to anywhere will cost a mere one kwai. But wait a minute, it gets better. Avail yourself of a Beijing Public Transport Holdings Limited smart card issued from the Beijing Municipal Administration and Communication Card Company, but obtainable from most subway stations, similar to London's Oyster Card or Hong Kong's Octopus or Dubai's Null Card, and a bus journey costs not one kwai, but four jiao, that's 0.4 yuan. And being proud of my Scottish heritage, not to mention my adopted home of Yorkshire, where they say that men have short arms and long pockets, you might wonder why I ever even bother with the metro when the buses are so cheap. But one look at a bus stop might well explain that conundrum, though that I know is a poor excuse. I mean, there's a perfectly good website containing bus maps 
and even a service where you type in your start and end points and it tells you which buses to take. What could be easier? Or rather, what could be easier if you can type in Chinese? There's no pinyin equivalent, unfortunately. Not that you're ever likely to overspend on transport here. Take the taxis, for instance. In the old days, there were three types of taxi, charging 1.2, 1.6, or 2 kwai per kilometer, depending on whether the car was a Shali, a Citroën, or a Volkswagen. Nowadays, all the taxis are either Volkswagen Jetta or Hyundai Electra, and they all charge the same 2 kwai rate. Whatever taxi company they operate with, you can tell them at a glance by their bright yellow stripe, regardless of whether the main body colour is blue, red, orange, green, brown, or whatever. A typical 15-minute journey is going to set you back around 10 kwai, although since the latest oil price hike, drivers will normally add on an extra yuan once the meter goes above 10. Most of the taxis are well showing their age, but they are plentiful and quite convenient, though not one driver in the whole of Beijing speaks a single word of English. I believe this is a prerequisite written into their contract to allow them to drive at all. And the only way to communicate is to have your destination written down in Chinese and wave this piece of paper under your driver's nose. If the Beijing taxis are too staid for your ingrained sense of adventure, then maybe a bike cab would be more to your way of thinking. They operate only in their own little locality and apparently you have to negotiate a reasonable fare before you start the journey, which is the main reason I haven't, so far, plucked up the nerve to try one out. But give me time, they look a whole load of fun. Of course, at the opposite end of the scale for longer distances are the many train lines that operate out of Beijing. The capital has three main railway stations, Beijing Railway Station, Beijing West Railway Station and Beijing South Railway Station. These latter two are among the biggest railway stations in the world, as I can testify from my journey a couple of weeks back to Tianjin. It was from Beijing South that I took the bullet train to Tianjin. It was a sleek, ultra-clean, ultra-comfortable and ultra-fast train that was simply a joy to travel on. Unfortunately, since the rollout of the high-speed connection from Beijing to Shanghai, the high-speed railway suffered one misfortune after another. A high-speed train heading for Shanghai halted for over two hours in Jinan, only ten days after the line's debut. Another five malfunctions occurred in the next four days, raising doubts about the safety of the trains. But on July the 23rd, a fatal collision occurred after a train was struck by lightning when crossing a bridge in Wenzhou, Zhejiang, and was then rear-ended by a second train, resulting in the death of at least 39 people with 192 injured. Four of the carriages of the first train even plunged off the bridge. Not surprisingly, the issue was front-page news for a week and put the entire future of the high-speed rail network in doubt. Three top railway officials were promptly sacked as it was revealed that the trains have no automatic braking system, meaning that the driver himself has to apply the brakes in the event of an emergency. And later in the week, it was revealed that signals that should automatically have turned red failed to respond to the presence of the stopped train up ahead. Passengers were cancelling their prepaid tickets in droves, and the regional airlines were having a field day as their share prices shot up in contrast to railway companies that saw their market valuations plummet. Beijing municipality ordered a strengthening of safety procedures on the city's subway network in the wake of the fatal crash and stressed the four requirements for safe subway operation. Carriages should not be overloaded. Platforms not overcrowded. Passages not overcongested. And escalators not operating at full capacity. Statistics published last Friday by Beijing Subway showed more than 6.2 million journeys were made on July the 15th, creating a new record, adding that the metro's passenger capacity had reached its limit. So it will be interesting to see what, if anything, changes when riding the metro network around Beijing in the near future. But one thing I think I can safely predict with near certainty is that as long as the hot weather lasts, Beijing's male population will continue to enjoy the numerous examples of eye candy riding the city subway's escalators.